Well, a few years ago, I saw a story about a corporate outing to Six Flags Great America in Gurney. How many of you have been to Six Flags? I would guess lots of you have been to that amusement park. Now, how many of you love roller coasters? If you love roller coasters, I have a story for you. Some big company had rented out the whole park so employees, their employees could have a whole day of fun together. And now fun is a different way of saying happy. And happy is what many people think of as joy. So you could say in a way that these big amusement parks are just giant artificial joy machines. But this particular outing didn't go quite as planned. At some point, the group decided to ride this huge roller coaster called the Demon. Now, to me, that's like the first clue, right? Uh, the Demon. But it's one of those roller coasters that does the 360-degree loops. And on that day, while this group was on that ride, uh, the ride malfunctioned, and the whole group got stuck uh, hanging upside down for something like two hours. Now, that looks like fun, doesn't it? Now, they were all rescued safely, which is good, but there's a lesson there, I think. Sometimes our search for joy and happiness leads to something far different. We're in a series now called Choosing Joy, the third week of the series, from the New Testament book called Philippians. And we're learning that according to the Apostle Paul, joy is not something we find by aiming directly for it. Uh, by trying to manufacture it for ourselves, by paying for it. Rather, joy is always the byproduct of something else. Last week, Pastor Jeff said this, joy is not circumstantial, joy is consequential. That is, joy is the consequence of a relationship. Joy is the consequence, the byproduct of a relationship with Christ that we describe every week here at Chapel Street when we say we want you to experience grace. We believe that the gospel, the good news, is that the grace of Christ gives us new hearts, first of all, through the forgiveness of sin, and forgiveness brings us joy. We believe the grace of Christ brings us, secondly, a new identity, which is ours when we are spiritually reborn into a new life and adopted into God's family. A new family where we are completely known and completely loved through which we experience joy. We believe the grace of Christ then gives us a new purpose that is a new understanding of the meaning of our lives. And through that we experience joy. We'll talk about that later today. And finally, the grace of Christ gives us a new destiny, an eternal destiny, which is the source of both hope and joy. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later today as well. Now, today we're jumping in uh, in the first chapter of Philippians at verse 19. So follow along as I read our text today. The Apostle Paul writes, Yes, and I will rejoice. There's that word. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, uh, going back a little bit, remind you of Paul's situation here. Uh, Paul's in prison, likely in Rome, chained 24-7 to a Roman imperial guard. And so when he says this will turn out for my deliverance, there's kind of a double meaning here. Because the Greek word translated deliverance can also be translated as salvation and is in other parts of the New Testament. So he can mean here either his deliverance from prison or the ultimate deliverance of salvation. That is the promise of eternity with Christ as we're going to see in just a few minutes. Verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents." This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, 
You should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. In this passage, Paul talks about joy in three ways. Joy in life, joy in death, and joy in mission. Let's start with joy in life. A few years ago, my brother Joe, who's a pastor in Ohio, uh, told me the story of a young attorney in his church. Uh, Before putting his faith in Jesus, this young man uh, was very bright and ambitious, but had no interest in spiritual things at all. He saw the Bible and Christianity and church as just kind of useless religious mythology. Had no time for it. His first job out of law school then was clerking for a well-respected judge in Ohio. And he was very excited because he thought this could give him a leg up to have her on his resume and so forth. Uh, And eventually he was able to make an appointment one-on-one with this judge. Uh, And he wanted to use this to advance his own uh, career path, of course. At one point in the conversation, he noticed the Bible sitting on the judge's desk. And before he could catch himself, he said, "Uh, do you read that? Now the judge didn't blink and looked back at him and said, of course I do. You sound surprised. The young attorney realized he may have overstepped a bit, so he sort of stammered, uh, well, I'm just a little surprised that someone as smart as you would read something like that. And this judge looked at him square in the eye and said, let me ask you something. What's your philosophy of life? And the young attorney thought for a moment and then said, well, uh, I guess to work as hard as I can and have as much fun as I can. To which the judge said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Now, her response shocked him, but it started him on a journey of spiritual exploration that eventually led to faith in Jesus. Here Paul writes in verse 19, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is is gain. Now I put this verse in red because it's the very center of the passage we're studying today. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now for my money, this is one of the most astonishing and shocking and powerful verses in all of the Bible. Two colliding images, life and death. And Paul says he finds joy in both. Let's look at joy in life. He says, for me to live is is Christ. I want you to follow along with me here a bit and let's play a little fill-in-the-blank game. What if I said, for me or for you, uh, to live is blank? How would you fill in that blank? Or how have you filled in that blank at different times in your life? For me, from my teens to my early 20s, I would have said, if I was honest, for me to live is basketball. I mean, I loved basketball. I woke up in the morning thinking about how I could become a better player. I devoted thousands of hours to practice. In many ways, basketball became my identity. I once talked to a woman who told me that synchronized swimming saved her life. So at one point, she would have said, for me to live is synchronized swimming. Maybe you would have said, for me to live is Bobby or Susie or put in some other name of a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or maybe you would say, for me to live is my kids, or my grandchildren, or my family, or maybe work, or for me to live is to be at my vacation home whenever I have a chance. We fill in that blank in all kinds of ways. Someone has said, the two most important days of your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Paul fills in that blank with Christ. What does that mean? Well, first let me tell you what I think he does not mean. Paul does not mean religion. Now, Paul knew all about religion. As we're going to find out in a couple of chapters, Paul was one of the most religious people of his time. He kept all the religious rules. He did all the religiously correct things. And what it got him was a life filled with pride and rage and violence. So when he says to live as Christ, he does not mean go to church every week or watch online every week. He does not mean giving money or participating in service projects. For Paul, all those things are good, but they're secondary. Because those religious activities are not life. For Paul, Christ is life. But what does that mean? Well, I think it means that where once Paul was spiritually dead, he is now, by the grace of Christ, 
spiritually alive. In his letter to the Ephesians, he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I think as Paul wrote those words so long ago, he was remembering who he was. He was remembering the things that he once did, awful things, vile things, things he was ashamed of. And he's now celebrating that he's no longer that person. That the grace of Christ, his relationship with Christ, has fundamentally changed his identity. Remember, uh, Paul started his letter by addressing the saints in Christ at Philippi. Pastor Jeff pointed out the significance of those two little words, in and at. They are at Philippi. And that's where they live geographically and culturally but they are in Christ because that's who they now are. Everything Paul does and is flows from his sense of this new identity in Christ. Secondly, he finds joy in life through his calling, through the work God has called him to do. Verse 22, he says, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. What's he mean by fruitful labor? Last week we saw that for Paul, fruitful labor meant to proclaim Christ, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, even in prison, even chained to a Roman guard. For Paul, it meant to live for and work for the joy of others. In verse 24, he says, But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. See, Paul finds great joy in caring about and working for the joy of others. And finally, fruitful labor for Paul also means to honor Christ. Going back to verse 20, he says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. Paul's purpose is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ in how he lives and, if necessary, in how he dies. This is the mission of his life. This is the source of Paul's joy. Now, Pastor Jeff talked on, touched on this last week, but I want you to see this. Paul experiences joy in life, even in prison, even when suffering, because his identity His purpose and the source of his joy are indestructible. That is, they are not dependent on his circumstances. If his joy was dependent on circumstances, something like basketball or synchronized swimming or even his health or his freedom or his vacation home by the sea, then his joy would be crushed by circumstances. But because his life is Christ, proclaiming Christ, honoring Christ, His joy is indestructible. Paul finds joy in life. Secondly, he finds joy in death. Joy in death. Now, I realize that the phrase joy in death just just sounds wrong. It's absolutely nonsensical to say that in our culture today. And that's because we, culturally speaking, see death, physical death, as the worst thing that can happen. But from a biblical perspective, while death is the enemy of life, it's not the worst thing that can happen. Now let me explain. The vast majority of human beings who have ever lived across cultures and across civilizations, including followers of Jesus for the last 2,000 years, have simply assumed and accepted that suffering and death are part of life. But we, those of us living in the 21st century in North America, are the exceptions to this. Due to our relative affluence and the availability of modern medicine, we have come to think that it's our right, our right to have a pain-free and disease-free existence. And when disease or death come near to us or touch our lives, we think something's wrong. Uh, Someone's to be blamed, maybe doctors, maybe the hospital, maybe the government, maybe even God. By the way, this is why, I don't know, 90% of our prayers are about physical health physical safety, 
healing? Is it wrong to pray this way? No, of course not. But if we pay attention in the New Testament, Paul never prays to get out of prison. He never prays his life will be spared or extended. He never prays to avoid suffering or pain. He prays, he asks for prayer that he will boldly stay on mission. Because the source of his joy is not in his circumstances. The source of his joy is Christ. And his mission is to proclaim the gospel. And this is why he does not say, for me to live is to be happy. For me to live is to be healthy. For me to live is to be financially secure and comfortable. Rather, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But what can he possibly mean by to die is gain? Does Paul want to die? Does he have some kind of morbid death wish? No. Paul doesn't want to die. He wants to live. He just said, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. He longs to see his Philippians friends again. He prays for them. He desperately wants to help them grow in their joy. But while he wants to live, he is not afraid to die. Because he knows that he is in Christ. And because his identity and his hope is in Christ, he knows that physical death, brings a far greater promise than physical life can ever bring. Which is why he says, Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. In 2 Corinthians 5, he says it this way, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Paul can find joy even in death because... He knows it means being at home with Christ. And it's exactly this confidence and this hope that allows Paul to live with such courage and compassion. In his book, The Rise of Christianity, an author named Rodney Stark points out that one of the reasons for the rapid growth of the Christian community in the first two centuries uh, was how followers of Jesus behaved during two great pandemics uh, that were about a century apart, that wiped out up to a third of the entire Roman Empire. Pandemics. We hear that word a lot, don't we? While others fled the city to find safety, the Christians stayed in the cities and ministered to the sick. And they did this for two reasons. First, they did it because they knew that Jesus had called them to love their neighbors as themselves and to care for the sick. And secondly, they did it because they weren't afraid to die. The result was many of those they cared for survived and became believers in Christ themselves, and so the Christian community grew exponentially. So it was the hope of the gospel that allowed those early believers to live with courage and compassion. When we know that death is gain, we are then paradoxically free to live and live as God calls us to live. Make a statement here. Paul knows that death is not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen is facing death without Christ. Paul found joy in death. Thirdly, Paul finds joy in mission. Pastor Tim Keller tells the story of a man named Bill Thomas, a Harvard-trained physician who became the medical director of a nursing home in upstate New York. As he, when he arrived, he observed the, the hopelessness and despair of these elderly residents, and he decided he needed to try to do something. So he brought in animals, dogs, cats, chickens, rabbits, a hundred parakeets, uh, totally against all the ordinances and rules. But he did it so the residents would have something to care for and to attend to. He planted gardens so all the residents had at least one plant they could care for. And what happened was stunning. The residents began to behave differently. They started to dress themselves. They walked more on their own. Drug prescriptions fell, and the death rate was cut by 50%. Why? Human beings are created for meaning, for purpose. We need to know that our lives, that we make a difference for someone else. We need to know that something we do is greater than ourselves. Paul explains it this way in verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, he says. I want to pause here for a minute. The Greek word translated your manner of life actually comes from the political world. It literally means live as a citizen. Behave as a good citizen. Now, 
In using this word, Paul is reminding the Philippians of what he said earlier in the letter to the saints in Christ at Philippi. The Philippians were very proud of their citizenship. They were proud to be citizens of Philippi. They were proud to be citizens of Rome. But Paul is reminding them that their primary identity is no longer as Philippians, is no longer as citizens of Rome, but their identity is in, their, is in Christ and their citizenship is the kingdom of God. And he wants them to live like it. Makes me wonder if he could, what the Apostle Paul would say to us today. He might say, you saints in Christ at Chapel Street, you saints in Christ at the Fox Valley, be good citizens, not just of the kingdoms of this world, of Illinois and the USA, but be good citizens of the eternal kingdom of Christ because he is your king. Paul continues, so that whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Now I want you to see when Paul says, do not be frightened by your opponents, he's not talking about people who just didn't agree with them on Twitter or people who confronted them on Facebook and said mean things. These are people in places of real power who could arrest them, torture them, and kill them. Paul urges them to stand firm, stand together in one spirit. Notice, not for a political party or a political candidate, not in order to overthrow Caesar or the power of Rome, but rather for the faith of the gospel. And Paul says this because he believes that the gospel is a power far greater than the power of Caesar or the power of Rome itself. And today we know that, that he was right because the Roman Empire is in ruins while the gospel has spread all over the world. And finally, verse 29, he says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. I told someone this week there may not be a passage in the Bible more contrary to the American dream than this one right here. It has been granted to you not to have a pain-free and trouble-free life, not to have two cars in your garage and a, a house as big as you want it. It has been granted to you to what? To suffer for his sake. Now, why would Paul say this? Why would he say such a thing? I want to talk just for a moment, especially to, to our younger people watching, middle school, high school students, 20s and 30s. Paul says this because he knows, he knows that to follow Jesus is always, always to swim upstream against the current of our culture. To anchor your identity in the grace of Christ, to find your joy in living for his purpose, to love your neighbor as yourself, to pray for your enemies, to accept even death with joy is going to make you different. And the world does not like different. Way back in the mid-1990s, uh, a Romanian pastor named Joseph Sohn came to preach um, at Chapel Street, formerly First Baptist Church of Geneva, at our South Street campus. Dr. Sohn was a well-known preacher at that time. Uh, throughout the 70s and 80s during the oppressive communist regime of Nikolai Ceausescu. And, and Ceausescu viewed all Christians and the Christian church as enemies of the state. Now, Dr. Sohn was uh, arrested repeatedly. He was beaten and ultimately threatened with death. And he told this story when he spoke to us. He said, the chief of the secret, secret police arrested him, called him in, and threatened to kill him if he didn't stop preaching. And Dr. Sohn responded by saying, sir, uh, don't you understand that when you kill me, you send me to glory? You cannot threaten me with glory, he said. And then the officer said, Dr. Mr. Sohn, don't you know I can have you killed right here today and your blood will drain down that drain and no one will ever know what happened to you. But Dr. Sohn said, yes, sir, I know you have that power over me. But with all due respect, sir, let me tell you how that will work. My sermons are on tape all over this country. And when you shoot me or crush me, whichever way you choose, you will sprinkle my sermons with my blood and I will speak 10 times louder in death than I ever did in life. With all due respect, sir, that's how that will work. The regime decided not to kill Dr. Sohn, but they exiled him. He came to America for about two years or so, I think. He kept on preaching, sending tapes, and eventually 
The Ceausescu regime fell. Some of you will remember that story. And he returned to Romania and preached for many years after. Now, we're not all called to be the Apostle Paul. There's only one Apostle Paul. We're not all called to preach like Joseph's son. But I think Paul's telling us we are all called to live with an indestructible kind of joy. A joy that's a byproduct of the grace of Christ. A joy that we can know in life. A joy that we can know in death. And a joy that we know by living on mission. You bow with me as I close. Lord God, how we thank you today for your word. I thank you for the truth and power of the gospel. And may your grace shape in us a new identity, a clear and bold purpose, a unity and courage of spirit, and a joy that is indestructible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.